aren't so healthy either without adequate fiber, and that releases all kinds of problems then. Okay, so fiber is a pretty obvious one. Another kind of obvious one is vitamin B12. You need B12. You probably know this already for healthy nerves and healthy blood, and supplementing is a really good idea. But when people are older, they can really run low in B12 for a couple reasons. One is that, if, let's say a person is not vegan, and they're trying to get their B12 from meat. Uh, well, there is B12 in it, but without a lot of stomach acid, you can't pull the B12 off the protein, and so even though they're eating an omnivorous diet, they're low in B12. Um, if uh, they're on medication, metformin, most common diabetes medication, uh, acid blockers, also really common, those reduce um, B12 absorption. So, so medications can kick in for a lot of older folks, and so they end up being low in B12, and the answer for them is just like the answer for everybody else. Go to your local health food store, go online, go to a drugstore and pick up the smallest B12 supplement they have and take that. Uh, maybe just a couple of others, Chuck, that I'm just going to mention really quickly. Um, one is calcium, and calcium is a funny one because um, the requirements that the government will specify are pretty high. Let's say 1,000 milligrams or for older people, maybe 1,200. You think, gee, yeah, there's no way I'm getting there. Why is it so high? It's, I believe it's high because the dairy industry has push the government to tell people they need more calcium. If you look at the scientific literature, I would say about 700 milligrams per day is the amount that you ought to aim for. Where do you get it? Um, you get calcium, you know it off this already. Uh, green leafy vegetables, number one source, beans, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, and maybe just to, to wrap it up, uh, vitamin B is something that normally comes from sunlight on your skin. The older we get, uh, for a lot of folks that are indoors, uh, more of the time, they're not getting much sun, and so they should be taking a vitamin D supplement, probably. Um, most doctors will suggest about 2,000 international units a day. So those, those are some of the key, key issues for folks uh, nutrient-wise as they get older. The calcium uh, being, you might not need as much as uh, what, the, what the RDAs suggest right now. That's fascinating. So in the studies that have been published, about 700 milligrams a day, that will protect you pretty well against fractures and all of the other concerns that people have when they're short on it? That's exactly right. Um, if you have very little calcium in your diet, you know, a couple of hundred milligrams per day, you are at higher risk for a fracture. And so if you go from 300 to 500 to 600, you're going to reduce your risk of fracture. But once you get to about 700, it's really hard to make a case that going higher than that does any good at all with regard to the fracture risk. And where people run into trouble um, is they're saying to their kids, uh, make sure you have lots of milk because it's high in calcium. And they're just kind of regurgitating the, the promotions they heard. What do you end up doing? You end up giving the kid all the problems that milk will cause from the saturated fat that increases risk of heart disease, milk is linked to long-term risk of prostate cancer, and you don't want to set up your male members of your family for, for prostate cancer. There's some evidence, not as strong, but, but still compelling, linking milk to breast cancer. So there's, there's every reason to not shoot for these really high uh, calcium targets if you're doing it with an unhealthy food like dairy. If you're doing it with green leafy vegetables, there's really not much risk of having a little extra Brussels sprouts or, or some broccoli here and there. Yeah, I know my, my granddaddy, before his passing, he was really big on getting all of his calcium from cheese. And it could have been a hunk of cheddar or it could have been cheese. Oh, my gosh. Cheese was in a can. Uh, but he was always like, I'm getting my calcium. And, it, uh, you know, at the time, I, I was like, good for you, granddaddy. This is so good. You know, you're, you're going to have those good, strong teeth and bones. Uh, but man alive, I mean, just the conversations that you and I have had over the years on this show, I mean, there really are a lot better sources of calcium that a person could get than eating cheese. You, you said it, Chuck. I mean, uh, if you had a calcium supplement that was 70% fat, I mean, that is, that is not one you want to choose. Okay, so uh, let's kind of put a put a bow on this conversation here. So uh, we, we've talked about a lot of other nutrients, but would I be correct in assuming that Kathleen is kind of wondering the same thing here. Would I be correct in assuming that the requirements for things like vitamin A, vitamin C, those kinds of vitamin K, like they really don't change over the years? They don't change a lot. Um, when the, um, the U.S. government looks at all these recommendations, and they do modify them a little bit here and there, but by and large, uh, after about age 19, or so they're about pretty much relatively flat for the rest of the time, even when people are old. 
Here's an interesting one from Lori. She sent me an email and she, uh, she linked off to an article that said that seniors should increase their fat intake. Do you know whether or not there is any scientific evidence to back that up? Okay. Um, what they're probably thinking of is that when you're older, you're at higher risk of dementia and the brain uses omega-3s. And so the idea is let's just st stuff a bunch of fat in the brain and hope that, it, that we're going to be protected. What really matters is the quality of fat. It, 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 it's got to be certain types. Um, and the typical fat that's in cheese is not omega-3. The typical fat in a burger is not omega-3. Um, so what a person really needs is um, less fat overall. Because if you're having a lot of unhealthy fats, it actually competes with the good fats and it will actually slow down the omega-3 production. So you really, you, you, no, no, you, you don't want to increase fat overall, but you do want to make sure that proportionately of the fat you're getting, it's high in omega-3. What do I mean? You take some broccoli, send it to a lab, and they'll say, you thought it was fat-free, but it's actually seven or 8% of, uh, of the broccoli's calories are actually fat, believe it or not. Yeah. And what matters is that proportionately, the omega-3 is really very high in green leafy vegetables. So not much fat overall, but proportionately a lot of omega-3. And over time, if you eat a lot of those foods, the fats in your body tend to mirror the proportions in your foods. So if your foods are proportionally high in omega-3, you will, you will be too. Um, some people will supplement um, with omega-3s. If you do skip the fish oil, you can get exactly the same thing in a cleaner, package with vegan omega-3s. Um, there's DHA, EPA supplements. Uh, controversial, uh, they probably increase the risk of prostate cancer in men, so a lot of people are not recommending them, but if you're choosing, um, that's, that's what people are looking at. All right, so we're talking about omega-3 and brain health there, but Troy's wondering about what other nutrients might be important for brain health. Uh, certain things you gotta avoid, um, certain things you want to pump in. Um, number one thing to avoid, and you've heard me say this before, saturated fat, that's the fat that's in dairy, fat that's in, in meat. Um, even your Chinook salmon has a surprising amount of saturated fat strongly linked to dementia, particularly Alzheimer's. And the Chicago Health and Aging Project almost 20 years ago reported these findings that people eating the most saturated fat, that means dairy, that means meat, had about two to three times higher risk of Alzheimer's compared to people who generally avoided those things. So saturated fat, avoid. Trans fats, avoid. That means snack foods. It also means um, there are traces in dairy of trans fats, believe it or not. Um, uh, also to avoid excess iron. Uh, not green leafy vegetables, they're okay because they have non-heme iron, but uh, meat products have iron. Uh, animal products have too much copper. Those can damage the brain. Things to take advantage of, um, vitamin E is actually okay. And that's in nuts and seeds. Not a lot uh, because yes, they are fattening, uh, but maybe an ounce, something like that a day will give you a good chunk of uh, vitamin E. And vegetables and fruits in general, when researchers look at people who avoid them, people who eat vegetables and fruits, uh, the vegetable and fruit eaters have a lot lower risk of cognitive decline, even if you're just comparing a person who has zero versus a person who has about one serving a day. So if you pump it up, you have two or three servings a day, um, you're getting, you're, you're doing your kind of big favor there too. We were just talking about copper and, and metal in the diet. I want to take a question now from Sheila, who's wondering about iron. She says, should I limit the amount of greens and soy in my diet because they're high in iron? She said she's worried about Alzheimer's risk. Uh, well, first of all, it's good that you're worried because Alzheimer's is the last thing you want to get, and foods do play into it. But the, the short answer is no, I would not worry about the greens and I would not worry about soy. Um, but you're thinking right, you don't want to overdo it with iron. The good news about any vegetable source, any plant source of iron, is that it comes in the form of what we call non-heme iron. Um, and that means that it is the type that your body can absorb more of if you're low in iron. And if you're high in iron, your body will actually keep it out. So if you eat lots and lots of green vegetables, your body is monitoring your, yes, this, your body actually monitors your iron content, so to speak. Um, and if you need more iron, it'll absorb more. If you're already iron overloaded, it absorbs less. 
Contrast that with a steak. Uh, animal products have a lot of what's called heme iron, and the heme iron barges into your party whether you need it or not. So, so the, the, the bad sources of iron are the liver, meat products in general, um, because they have a, they, they will tend to lead you into overload. Um, and so what, what is the limit that we're looking at when it comes to iron? I, I, Alzheimer's runs in my family. I know that it runs in millions of other families uh, around the world. So is there a threshold that we should be worried about uh, when it comes to iron? And we also get this question a lot, Dr. Barnard, is if somebody is taking a multivitamin, uh, multivitamin supplement, should they be looking for one that does not have iron in it? The answer is yes. Um, look at the label and uh, one a day and so forth. They, they want to sell you something that sounds complete. They know you need iron, so they throw the iron into the package and you'll see it on the, on the label. And they know you need copper, so they'll throw copper in there. What they missed is that there is iron in the foods that you're eating, and there's copper in the foods you're eating. So, yeah, um, if you want to take a multiple vitamin, go online or go to the store and get one that's marked vitamin only. Um, and, and they will say that. They're not a lot of them, but, but you'll see them. And then when you look at the ingredients, there's vitamin D12, there's B vitamins, and, and so forth, um, most of which you're getting from food anyway, so you don't really need, need it. But if there's no added iron, that's good. If there's no added copper, that's good. Now, um, some of the companies like Centrum uh, years ago started to realize that particularly women uh, after menopause, their needs for iron changed a lot. They're no longer menstruating. They're no longer losing iron every month. And so you start accumulating it, and men have been accumulating it all their life. And so they, um, they took the iron out of, say, Centrum Silver, which is the one for people older. So that's good, but unfortunately, they haven't caught up on copper. They still pack the copper in there. So yeah, pick a mul if you're going to use a multivitamin, pick one that does not have iron, does not have copper. But you might also ask why you're bothering with a multivitamin anyway. If you just go to the store and get B12, frankly, that's got you covered. Or B12 and D, you probably don't need uh, your multi. I'm going to take a question now from Annie, who's watching us on YouTube. This one came in at 12.11 today. Um, we were talking about having too much of a certain vitamin or nutrient in the diet. A lot of that comes from, through supplementation. But Annie is wondering specifically, what do you do if you have too much calcium in your system? Too much calcium in your system. I, I guess I'm wondering what uh, what you're thinking about now. If, if it's that you got a blood test and just showed that it was high in calcium, your doctor is going to investigate that and see if there's some other some other explanation that's it's, that's not a common finding. And your doctor can look to see if there's a physiological explanation. Um, people talk about calcium in a couple of other contexts. One is kidney stones. Um, one is heart blockages. Now, heart blockages are calcium. You know, they end up being calcified as time goes on. And the answer to both of these is a healthier diet. If you are taking calcium supplements because you have been low in calcium and you've had fractures and your doctor's got you on a specific regimen, take the calcium with food. Don't take it on an empty stomach. If you take it with food, you're, somehow your body kind of balances things out a little bit. And uh, calcium with food is not associated with kidney stones, calcium on an empty stomach is associated with kidney stones. So, so have it with your food. Um, but hopefully you don't need a calcium supplement and hopefully you're getting calcium just from the, uh, the levels uh, in the foods that you're eating naturally. Now, one other thing, uh, just one, one last thing, and that's vitamin D helps your body absorb calcium. So when you're talking with your doctor about it, the doctor will look at your calcium intake, your vitamin D intake, which helps the calcium come in, and to see if there's anything could be hormonally going on that might affect your calcium level. All right, let's look at another nutrient on the opposite end of the spectrum. So we've been talking about too much of something. Now let's talk about when you may not have enough of something. Janice is uh, wondering, what should you do, what should you eat when your iron levels are too low? Okay, we need to bring in more iron, but we bring it in in a healthy, uh, healthy source. And green leafy vegetables and beans are the healthiest source. I was mentioning earlier that the non-heme iron is more absorbable when your body needs more. Um, some people use the lemon trick, uh, uh, a little bit of lemon juice. Um, any high vitamin C food will increase the absorption. However, let me, let me give you a big caveat here. Um, how do we know that our iron level is too low? If it was just a blood test 
and your doctor said, you're kind of borderline low. Um, if you feel well, if you are not anemic, if you have no symptoms, to be on sort of the low end of the iron window is actually a good thing. That means you're at the least risk for Alzheimer's, least risk for heart disease. Now, if you're frankly, frankly low, so that you're anemic and sluggish and so forth, then you've obviously got to take it seriously. And uh, when we're talking about iron and Alzheimer's risk, I always like to also bring up uh, cookware into the equation. Um, brought up saying a cast iron skillet is about the best thing that you could have in your kitchen. Come to find out that's really not such a good idea, is it? Well, it's a good thing that you put a nail on the wall and you put it there and it looks sort of like a rustic environment and you never actually take it down and cook with it. That's fine. Uh, the problem is when you do cook with it, yeah, the, you're absolutely right, Chuck. The, the iron will end up in the food. And so if it's your once every two months pan, big deal, uh, no, no, no real problem. But if it's your go-to pan, which for a lot of people it is, you know, they love their cast iron pan, they use it every day. Yeah, you are getting too much iron and it is absorbable and you don't want that. Um, I know this sounds like just too ultra modern, but there is nothing wrong with a nonstick pan. Uh, very controversial, people remember Teflon, you know, from the 70s that would chip off and, and also as it would heat, it would give off toxic fumes. Um, those problems have really been solved. And so the modern nonstick pans really are, are quite good. You don't, you don't have to use them, but they allow you to escape the iron, you escape the aluminum, and you're escaping the added fat. A couple of quick hellos to some roomies who are joining us live today. GP saying uh, that they're watching the exam room live, live for the very first time. Very cool. Thanks for being here. Also want to say hi to Paul, who's watching us from Bracebridge, Ontario, Canada. I hear it's lovely this time of year in Bracebridge. So thank you so very much for tuning in, um, Paul. Uh, Dr. Barnard, let's go back to aging here. Take a question from Greg, who's wondering uh, whether the risk for certain diseases like cancer actually decrease over the age of 80. Well, kind of disturbing statistic here, really. Um, the average age for many of the common cancers, um, if you look at lung cancer, breast cancer, and these things, it's way up in the upper 60s, typically. So what that means is that half the cases occur before that time, and the other half all occur after that time. So when people are in their older years, that's when, frankly, you see a lot of cancer happening pretty fast. Um, there's an exception to that, though, in that sometimes people are killed by other things first. You know, the cardiovascular disease becomes their preoccupation and not so much um, cancer. But yes, um, cancers can uh, occur more and more commonly as people age. Uh, partly their defenses, their immune defenses, are not as strong. And frankly, their accumulated exposures are, 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 are worse than ever. Uh, a guy who's been having dairy all his life, not going to get prostate cancer when he's 24, but when he's 84, very, it's much more likely. It's the same with smoking. You know, in the first year of smoking, your lung cancer risk is really low, but if you've been making a career of it, it gets higher and higher and higher. So, so uh, we, we don't want to think, okay, I'm up in years now, I can't get cancer. It's, it's always a really good good time to follow as healthy a diet as you possibly can. Um, I, I think maybe one of those reasons why this question piqued my interest is, uh, speaking with Dr. Will Bolsowitz, I believe he mentioned that past a certain age, really men don't have to worry too much about getting a colonoscopy. Uh, is, the, is that correct? Am I remembering that, that correctly? Um, that's reasonable advice. Um, and and it's for, for a couple of reasons. It's not that you're not at risk for colorectal cancer it's that it takes time for colorectal cancer to develop. And so that's why the colonoscopies are recommended maybe even every five years or, or less often. And because there's a small risk to colonoscopy, and not a big risk, but there is a small risk. I mean, there is such a thing as perforation and anesthesia problems and stuff. The doctor makes kind of an equation. It says, what's your real benefit? What's the likelihood I'm gonna find anything versus what's the likelihood of your having a problem with it? And once you're really up in years, they kind of decide maybe it's not worth it so much anymore. Um, so when people are in their 60s, um, early 70s, the doctors often start slacking off on those recommendations. Uh, not too terribly long ago, you and I did a show on high cholesterol, a very popular episode. And I've, I'm bringing this question back from it because it's a really important one, especially as we're talking about aging today. And this one is from Nina, who's wondering whether women are more likely to have high cholesterol after menopause. Yeah, they are. Um, 
Nobody really knows exactly the reason for it, but as estrogen shifts, estrogen levels fall at menopause, cholesterol levels do go up. Um, and the question, of course, is what can you do about it? And you already know the first part of that answer, which is get the cholesterol off your plate. So we don't want to be having animal products at all. Um, and it's not just the egg that has cholesterol, it's in meat, it's in dairy. And even worse is the fat that's in meat and in dairy, the, the saturated fat that I was um, criticizing before. It, uh, it drives cholesterol levels up, it certainly does. Um, so when you avoid those things, your cholesterol level for, for 90% of people, their cholesterol level falls. That's great. Um, if yours didn't, um, what I would suggest you do is take another couple of steps. One is not, not just no animal products, but keep oils really low. Take olive oil, for example. Uh, chicken fat is about 30% saturated fat. Olive oil, better, it's only 14. But if you didn't use any oil, it's zero. Um, so that's another step you can take. And also our good friend David Jenkins at, um, at the University of Toronto developed what he called the portfolio. And this meant you start with a vegan diet, but you add certain things to it. Soluble fiber. What's that mean? That means oats. You, you know, already know that oats will take a couple of extra points off your cholesterol. Beans, soy products uh, have an independent effect lowering cholesterol. And he found that nuts seem to do that too. Uh, for example, almonds. Be careful because if you go too far with the almonds, they can raise your, your weight. But his portfolio of soluble fiber, uh, a little bit of nuts, of um, soy products, and that kind of thing, really brought cholesterol down really, really fast when done as part of the vegan diet. All right, we've been talking about having too much of a certain vitamin or of a certain nutrient. Now let's talk about having too much of a certain food. Uh, Leonardo may win question of the day for this one. It comes in from uh, YouTube at 1223. It says, I love beans, and I wonder if I can have too much beans if there is an upper limit for consumption of the beans. So is it possible to eat way too many beans, Dr. Bodar? Not if you live alone. <laughs> Ask and answer. Okay. <laughs> Have all the beans you want in that case, not if you live alone. Oh you're gonna, no, you're, you are going to be fine. Be beans do not have any cholesterol in them. They don't have, they have virtually no saturated fat at all. They have iron, but the iron is in the form of non-heme iron. So you really, it's, it's hard for you to overdo it with the iron. They're fine. But you, you know, you don't want just beans. You know, beans, along with grain, um, are, that's a, re a really good complementary relationship. And don't forget the green leafy vegetables and fruits and so forth. So um, you want to make sure you're not crowding these more humble foods out of your diet too. All right, interesting question here from Elizabeth, one that I've uh, wondered myself as well. Uh, why are seniors hungry less often? Uh, a couple, couple of things can happen. Um, well, I guess the obvious thing, for some seniors, they're not as physically active. Um, you're staying home, you might be watching TV, and sometimes that can be aggravated if people have a physical problem like a joint disease that, that makes them less and less physically active. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, also, their hormones are changing, and so they're not burning calories off, even, even with the same level of physical activity, they're not burning calories so much. And then there are certain um, health conditions that can come in, uh, for some people, not others, thyroid disease, for example. And lots of chronic uh, conditions, if people have liver disease or kidney disease, um, their appetite, a uh, loss of appetite is, is a real common presenter, and that's one of the things that doctors will look for. They, and, and with relatively simple blood tests, they can sort those kind of things out. And uh, not to worry you, but a loss of appetite also occurs with really simple, uh, or I'm sorry, really serious problems like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and even certain cancers, so you want to check those out. But, but I think what you're really getting at is why do seniors just lose their appetite? It's really a lack of physical activity and some normal hormone issues. All right, so if you're not eating as much, if your meals are a lot smaller, then there's a good chance that you may not be getting enough uh, vitamins and nutrients in your diet, reaching those, uh, those daily needs. So Tammy has a good follow-up to that. How can you maximize nutrition while still eating a smaller meal? Ah, great question. Um, here's where I think the vegetables come to our rescue. You know, when I was a kid growing up in North Dakota, vegetables were just an afterthought. You had a hunk of like a pork chop or something, maybe a potato, 
and the vegetables could be carrots or green beans, and nobody noticed if you, eat, if you ate them or not, and nobody, nobody gave them any respect. If you put the vegetables into the middle of your plate, now you're getting fiber, you're getting healthy complex carbohydrates, and you're getting the really rich source of vitamins and healthy minerals that you really need. So um, I would say even start planning your meal with which vegetable or vegetables am I gonna, gonna really um, emphasize in this meal? And it could be more than one. Green vegetable, like broccoli, along with an orange vegetable, like sweet potatoes. Great combination, and that's where you're gonna get the nutrients powerful. coming in. All right, I want to pivot now and take a question that can really kind of apply to anyone, especially as they're really trying to take charge of their health for the first time. A lot of us turn to these apps these days where you can log every single food that you have and it just spits out, did you get enough of this? Did you not get enough of that? Diane writes and she says, look, I am frustrated. She says, I log everything that I eat in a nutrient tracking app and I still come up short with some vitamins. How can I get it right, and is it possible that I'm just worrying too much? Uh, you might be worrying too much. Here's the first question I would ask, is if you're logging in what, what you're eating, and then you're saying, am I getting enough protein, am I getting enough calcium, or whatever, and if it says low, the first thing I would look at is what standards are they using? We mentioned this a little bit earlier in today's program, calcium. The U.S. government will say have 1,000 milligrams a day, or even more for certain groups. It's really hard to defend that based on science. So you might say, well, I'm at 750, I'm too low. Uh-uh, 750 is fine. Um, same with iron. Um, if your iron levels are on the low end of normal and you're not symptomatic, meaning you're not tired, you feel well, there's nothing health-wise going on, there's no reason to really be pushing for some astronomical level. Same for protein. Uh, protein has kind of near religious significance for some people. You've got to have lots and lots of protein. I have 100 grams a day, I got to have 200 grams a day. Ridiculous. Uh, an adult woman needs 46 grams a day, according to the government, and even that has a buffer. That's higher than her, her actual need uh, for a man at 56. So anyway, that's the first thing to think about. Uh, are the standards right, or are they exaggerated? And the other thing is to make sure that you're getting a healthy um, mix of things in your diet, and that's four groups. You might know them already. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains and the, the bean group or, or the legume group, beans, peas, lentils. If you're getting lots of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans, that nutrient mix is going to be just about optimal. And don't forget the B12 uh, added to it. And, and at that point, you can probably not look at the app quite <laughs> as often as you might be doing now. Betsy uh, checking in in the chat room says, uh, look, my appetite is just fine and I'm a senior. She says, look, not this senior. I am literally hungry all the time. So uh, Betsy is probably eating a healthy diet if she's joining us here today. Um, here's, a, here's another question about menopause. I know that this is menopause is something that you cover extensively in your book, Your Body and Balance. We talked a little bit about it on the show here today also. But I don't think that we've ever been asked this question in particular. Uh, Donna Faye at 1228, she's joining us on Facebook today. She says, I'm going through menopause. Are grains still good for me? Yes, they are. In fact, they're, they're, they're more important than ever. Um, and, and I'm glad you asked that because a lot of people, particularly in the last what decade or so where low carbohydrate diets have come in, um, this unfortunate fad has gotten people to, to worry if they eat bread or if they eat brown rice, the idea is it's too many carbs. Carbohydrate is gonna be your best friend. And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, after menopause, if you're thinking, gee, you know, it's harder for me to, to keep the weight off, I'm, I'm, I'm gaining weight, or, or my cholesterol is, is up. Um, grains don't have any cholesterol. They have virtually no saturated fat, so they're, they're gonna help give you energy without driving your cholesterol up. And the calorie content of them is surprisingly low. Where, where grains get, get a bad rap is you put the whole grain toast in the toast, or whole grain bread in the toast. It pops out without very many calories. It's going to be a good thing to eat. But on goes the butter. Or the grain that uh, becomes spaghetti. Um, after it comes out of the pot, we slather cream sauce over the top of it, or ground beef, or oil, or something like that. It's those toppings that pack in the calories, and that was the problem with 
the big potato. There's nothing wrong with the potato. The problem is the butter and the cheese doodles and bacon bits and all this stuff that go on top of it. So the fatty toppings are the issue. Grains are going to be fine for you. One small exception. Uh, maybe one in ten people feel better when they don't have wheat. The other 90% of people are perfectly fine with wheat and with gluten. Uh, if, if weed or other gluten products are a problem for you, you may want to avoid them, but for other people, not an issue at all. All right, let's grab a couple of more here before we turn to an exciting article uh, that you uh, published uh, this week in, in a journal that I want to ask you about. Uh, but my goodness gracious, we've been talking about plant-based diets this entire time and different nutrients, but the one that hasn't come up yet? Protein. You knew it was coming to the conversation. Um, do protein requirements change for us as we get older? You will hear people say that older people should have a little bit more protein, and kind of what they're thinking of it is that older folks sometimes um, seem to lose their muscle mass, which is partly hormonal and partly inactivity. So it's frankly really good to maintain your activity. That's the most important thing. The activity then will fuel your appetite and you'll eat more normal amounts of food. You're going to be fine. Um, but it's a mistake to think, okay, I need more protein because I'm older, so let me have chicken. Or let me have more fish or let me have more meat or dairy or something like that, because what comes along with protein? Cholesterol, saturated fat, iron you don't need, the occasional tapeworm. You know, these are things, these are things you don't need in your diet at all. So, so it, the diet should remain 100% plant-based, vegan, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, and of these, the high protein group is the bean group, and anything made from them, like soybeans that turn into tofu or tempeh or that kind of thing, um, those are, are really quite rich in protein. And uh, you can include them at any age. And if you're older and trying to pump up your protein, that's one place to look. Uh, let's, uh, Laura Harris, 1232, a brave soul admitting her age. She says, I'm 41, exercise moderately six days a week. She's wondering specifically at that age and with that level of exercise, how much protein should she be taking in? I, well, first of all, you're a young woman, and it's great that you're exercising um, a lot. That's that's terrific, and I would not I would not think about it at all. And here, here's what I mean. Let's say you're out there for a run or a good brisk walk, and you know your muscles need more oxygen because they're working, right? How much oxygen should you take in? I don't know. I never measured it. You don't have to think about it. Why? Because your blood, your your body is monitoring your oxygen needs. And when you are hypoxic, when you are low in oxygen, your body automatically tells your diaphragm to start kicking in. You start breathing much more rapidly. You take in the oxygen, and then you breathe more slowly. Your body is pretty smart when it comes to protein needs, too, and also caloric needs in general. You could run a whole marathon. You could do that every day um, if you had the energy to do it. And your, you would not really have to plan so much how many calories you need because your body naturally kicks in extra hunger, and along with the natural foods that you're eating, you get the additional, not just calories, not just carbohydrates for energy, but you get the protein right along with it. So, your physical activity makes you hungry, the hunger brings food on your plate, you'll naturally pile it higher, and protein just comes right along for the ride. All right, I want to wrap up today by pivoting and talking about something completely different. And every once in a while, you know, I'll be exactly. thumbing through these journals and I'll see something and I'll say, huh, that is really interesting. And that happened this week and it just happened.